Okay, uh, I think we'll start. People are still coming in, but I'm going to get started. Um, my name is Paul Gross. I'm a senior fellow at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem. Um, I want to thank you all for joining. Um, I'm assuming that the majority of people uh, on this in this meeting are based in Israel. Um, this was primarily aimed at people who will be voting in three weeks time and wanted to um, be a little more informed ahead of that election. Um, but of course, um, very happy to have people from outside Israel as well that just want to uh, learn a little more about the crazy way Israel does politics. Um, uh, I think that um, there, are, there will be people here that are regulars um, for our, uh, we, our Wednesday events. And a lot of people that are just tuning in for the first time because of this. So let me just say, uh, for those that don't know, uh, that every Wednesday around this time, usually at this time, we have uh, an event on Zoom uh, in English. It's usually me um, interviewing or presenting, hosting uh, a special guest and discussing something in the realm of Israeli politics or current affairs or history or the Jewish world. And you can um, check out what we've got um, on offer on our website and on our uh, Facebook page. Um, you can also join my mailing list. Just email me paulg at begincenter.org.il. I'll write that in the chat box a bit later. Um, and if you're on my mailing list, then you'll receive a couple of emails from me a week um, telling you what's coming up. Okay, a um, couple of things about this presentation before I start with the with the um, with all the the facts and figures. Um, usually on these events, I have people's microphones muted throughout, and any questions are written in the chat box. Um, I think this time. Uh, even though there's a lot of people, um, I'm going to take the risk of um, people being able to unmute themselves and ask questions after I've done my presentation. So I'm going to ask you all, please, to keep yourselves muted during my um, presentation. Um, I'll leave plenty of time for questions, and then you can unmute yourselves, and we'll see how that works. Um, uh, if you have a question that you're dying to ask during the presentation, then maybe you could write it in the chat and I will hopefully see it there. Uh, secondly, I wanted to stress something very important. Um, this presentation that I'm about to give is not, um, is not an attempt to persuade you to vote in any certain way. My aim today is to inform you so that you can make your own decision on election day so that you can read the reports in Times of Israel or Jerusalem Post or Haaretz or wherever you read um, your Israeli news or get your Israeli news and have and have a better idea of what they're talking about. Okay, that's, um, that's something very important I should stress. Um, if anyone feels that I'm misrepresenting any issue or any party, then by all means, raise it with me and we'll discuss it. Okay, let's start. I'm going to, I'm going to, I have a PowerPoint presentation, which I'm going to use, which hopefully will make things a little clearer. Um, just a second. Okay, I assume everyone can see that. Okay, um, so let's, um, let's get started. Um, so, I don't know where everyone's from. My guess is that there's a large number of people originally from the United States um, and also people from the UK, Canada, Australia and other places thrown in. Um, so let's start just with the basics. My assumption here is that most of is that is that people don't know the basics. I apologize to those of you who do and for whom this is um, not so relevant, but it's important to, I think, make sure that everyone is, is on more or less the same page. So Israel has a parliamentary system with a lot of different parties. Um, those of you from the US who are used to a two-party system, we currently in the Knesset, um, which is uh, in the current Knesset, which will soon, of course, be uh, replaced after the election, we currently have 10 distinct parties 
parties in the Knesset. Um, and many, many, many more than that actually ran in the election. Um, so first uh, basic question, how are governments formed in Israel? You go to an election, you vote, you vote for a party, not for a person. You're not voting for president. You're not voting for the prime minister directly. And you're also not voting for a member of Knesset as you would be voting for a member of parliament in many parliamentary uh, democracies like the UK or Australia or Canada. You're voting for a party. Um, there are no constituencies or districts in Israel. The whole country is one is one parliamentary constituency, one district, right? So when you vote, you're, you're voting uh, for a party and the proportion of people who vote for that particular party, um, that party then receives that proportion of seats in the Knesset. Okay, it's a very, it's, it, in that respect, it's very simple. It's probably about the only thing that is simple in the Israeli system, but you have 120 seats in the Knesset. Um, and if, for example, a party gets 25% of the vote, that party will get 30 seats in the Knesset. Okay, 30 is 25% of 120. Okay, basic, uh, that's basic um, math. Um, elections are supposed to be held every four years. Um, in reality, they rarely last that long because uh, the government coalition, if the government coalition collapses, then an election is held uh, as a result of that. Um, obviously, now you're fully aware that we are about to have our fourth election in, a, in two years. So clearly um, something has gone wrong with the, with the system and we can talk about that. Um, but uh, every Israeli government is a, is a coalition government. Uh, there has there, for, in order for a uh, government to be formed, uh, the party or parties in the government have to represent a majority in the Knesset, right? So they have to get at least sixty-one seats out of the hundred and twenty. Okay, at least uh, over half of the seats. And there has never been a time in Israel's history that one party individually has attained that number of sixty-one seats, even in the days when you had parties that were very, very dominant, they got maybe 40 or so seats. So every so every, so what happens is that the largest party, um, usually the largest party after an election is given the job of um, forming a government. And they have to do that by meeting with the leaders of other parties, of smaller parties, and attempting to form a coalition with them, basically offering them um, ministerial positions, and promises to pursue certain policies that are important to the voters of that smaller party in order to seduce that party to join the coalition. Um, and then you uh, and then you can um, and then you can form a coalition that has once you get to the magic number of sixty one, you have a government. Um, that's the that's the basics. It's often not quite as simple as that. Um, which we'll get to, but that's the basic, that's the basic idea. Okay, so on March 23rd, um, those of you who are voting will walk into a voting booth called a Kalpi. You will um, see a list of, you'll see a row of, um, rows actually, of um, little white pieces of paper with the names of the parties on them and letters representing those parties. And you will choose one of those, put it in an envelope and then put it in the voting booth. And that's and you vote. There's no electronic voting in, in Israel. It's all done the old fashioned way. OK, so um, let's move on. OK, so this is the outgoing Knesset. And I'm showing you this um, for the both for the purposes of, of seeing who was just in power, the government that, 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 that we are that is out the outgoing government um, and also a, a useful illustration of how the system works and also how unpredictable it can be. So you'll notice here that, that whoever put this, um, this um, little uh, picture, this little diagram together, um, divided the parties into two blocks, center left and center right, and um, we'll get to that. And they put one party, Israel Beitenu, that's kind of outside of that. Um, we can explain that as well. But firstly, I want to explain that there were parties that ran for Knesset that did not make it in. Right, as I said, many, many, many more than the than, than these parties represented here actually ran for Knesset. The reason they didn't get in is because there's something called the electoral threshold. Okay, in Hebrew it's called Echuz Hachasima, um, 
And um, what that what that means is that a party has to get a certain percentage in order to get into the Knesset. It, it's changed over the years. It's actually been raised over the years. It currently stands at 3.25%. Okay? Unless a party gets 3.25% of the national vote, they do not get into the Knesset. So as I said, a party that gets 25% of the vote gets 30 seats in the Knesset. A party that would got 10% of the vote would get 12 seats in the Knesset. A party that gets 3% seat, three percent of the vote doesn't get into the Knesset at all, okay? Because they're below the threshold, which means that there's always a risk of voting for one of the smaller parties or one of the parties that's hovering um, on the edge of the threshold, as we say, because that party may not get in and you basically wasted your vote. Um, the th if you look at the number of Knesset seats, 3.25% works out at four seats, more or less. So no, any, anyone, if you look at the polls, any party that is polling at four seats or five seats, you can say that they're at risk of not making it over the threshold, potentially. Um, I see that I have a couple of questions. I'm just going to see if those are things which um, uh, should be answered now. Uh, why is the number of seats threshold for a party to have a seat raised so four million coalition would be easier? Okay, so... Look, it's been going up over the years, and there's always this question as to whether we should make it more, whether we should make it higher. And it's this, it's this basically this debate between democracy and stability, right? The more democratic the system is, right, the more representative it is, the less stable it is, right? You th for example, I think some countries that have a proportional system, I think Germany, for example, I think has a threshold of about 10%, right? So you have to really be a party that has a, a, a significant number of people voting for you before you can even get into the German parliament. Um, but some people would argue that's not, so that's less democratic. So there's this whole debate raging in Israel about that. Um, it's, as I said, it's only ever gone one way. It's only gone in one direction. It's only been, it's only ever been raised, the threshold. So logically, we can assume that in later years, it might be raised high but that's the current situation and this can be very very consequential um just to give you um an imp uh, a an example um this whole mess that we're currently in of of four elections in two years began with the election of let me get this right april 2019 um when netanyahu was not able to form a coalition because one of the right-wing parties that he was expecting to form a coalition with, Yamina, didn't make it past the threshold. It was literally like a few thousand votes short. If, if those few thousand people, a few thousand more people had voted for Yamina and it would have got four seats instead of none, instead of zero, then Netanyahu would have been able to form a government. Um, so it's, these things can be very, can be very consequential. Um, someone's asking me how many votes make up a seat. I'm afraid I don't have that figure to hand. I can look it up. Um, yeah, I'm, it, I mean, obviously it, it changes depending on the, as the population rises, it gets more because um, the number of seats in the Knesset, 120 doesn't change. Um, but as the population gets higher, the number, of, the number of votes that a parliamentary seat is worth um, increases. But I, don't, I can't tell you off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Um, okay, now let's... Um, Let's oh, let me quickly say something about the block. So centre left and centre right. So broadly speaking, um, we can talk about parties belonging to either the centre left, which is really the centre left and the Arabs. They're 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 put in with the centre left parties, even though on some issues they're not particularly left wing, um, and a set and a right religious block. Again, it's a little bit of a misnomer. The ultra orthodox parties are actually. Um, not necessarily right wing on some other on some on certain issues, okay? But they tend to vote along certain lines in the things in the issues that are um, in the issues that 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 we that we that are important these days. And we'll I'll get to those issues later in the presentation. I'm getting a lot of questions on the chat. Um, I want to ask you. Um, I want to ask you to just to hold those unless they're things which are really absolutely essential to understanding. What I'm oh, saying. Paul, well, can I ask a question? What happens to the votes where a party does not go over the threshold? Okay, so I'll quickly answer that question. Okay, 
Fine. So that so basically those votes are are distributed among the other parties. So it's not the 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 I mean the votes themselves. If you vote for a party, that party doesn't make it into the Knesset. Let's say I vote this election for um, blue and white, which which may not make it this time round. Okay. So if I vote for blue and white, and my um, and blue and white doesn't make it, essentially my vote is is rendered irrelevant. Um, but what happens is that because you can't have you can't have um, instead of getting four seats, they get none. But you can't have a Knesset of 116 seats. You have to have 120 seats. So the votes are essentially redistributed. The percentages um, is distributed throughout the, re- the other parts of the Knesset. So d- depending on how many votes short of uh, of an extra seat a party might be, it could get that extra seat. So let's say Likud was on 25 seats, but just a few more votes and it would make it up to 26 seats, it might get those few more votes from the votes that are distributed via the, uh, the, uh, the, vo- the votes lost by blue and white. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, okay, this was the coalition government that was formed after this election of, uh, of um, uh, 2020, um, of May, 2020. Um, now, who can spot, <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's a couple of, of, of weird inconsistencies here. Um, one of them is, the most glaring is, that as you see, blue and white are in here with 14 seats. But if you look at the results, blue and white got, got sorry, blue and white is Kachol Levan, for those that, don't, don't, that can't read the, uh, the English, tra- English transliterated Hebrew, the phonetic Hebrew. Kachol Levan is blue and white. So blue and white got 33 seats in the Knesset, in that election. They were the second largest party. In the coalition, they have 14 seats. Why? Because what happened was, um, Blue and White actually split into two set, into two parties. Benny Gantz, who was leader of Blue and White, um, decided to go with Netanyahu very controversially, having run on a platform of not sitting with Netanyahu. He decided to do it because, in his words, um, there was there was an emergency situation, uh, Corona. Uh, the country needed a functioning government. We couldn't afford to go to another election, and he was sort of putting in, he was putting um, the country before himself. That was his position. Critics said that it was a it was not it was a not, it was naive, and and he ended up um, basically being um, taken for a ride by Netanyahu. That's these these are the different perspectives. But but this was the coalition that was formed. So you can see to go back to my model of, 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 of how when I explain how, how a government is formed, Likud's the largest party, um, the leader of the largest party, Likud, Benjamin Netanyahu is the prime minister, and he forms a coalition with these other parties. And he and he has to, he basically doles out ministerial positions um, to senior figures, the leaders and other figures within these parties in order to get, in order to uh, entice them to join the coalition. So the leader of Blue and White, uh, Benny Gantz becomes the defense minister, um, uh, the uh, the number two in blue and white, Gabi Ashkenazi, became the foreign minister. Um, the leader of Shas, Arya Derry, uh, was the interior minister, and and so forth. Um, and the uh, and it's not just ministerial positions, right? It's also pursuing policies um, which are um, which are important to those parties. So most, uh, I guess, famously slash notoriously, depending on your perspective. The two ultra-Orthodox parties, Shas and UTJ, UTJ is United Torah Judaism, two ultra-Orthodox parties, um, they, uh, they are of Netanyahu's most reliable supporters, most reliable parties supporting the Likud, and they insist on certain things um, which are very unpopular with the country at large, but which Netanyahu, and not just Netanyahu, by the way, also previous prime ministers, have to give them in order to get them into his coalition. And without them, he doesn't have a coalition. So when they say we want exemption from the army and money for our um, yeshivot and our schools, um, et cetera, um, he, that, that's, the, that's the price. Um, that's the price they exact for, for, joining, for joining the coalition. Okay. Um, all right, what I want to talk a little bit about now is, and, and I, I, this won't take too long, I don't want to get into it too much because it's a lot of detail and it may not be so interesting for everyone, but I think it's useful um, kind of basic um, knowledge and history. Um, so 
first of all, I want to identify three periods in Israeli history. And this is my, um, this is my um, sort of analysis of this. Um, and I don't think it's particularly controversial. Maybe other people would, would change the, 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 the years a little bit. Um, but I think it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty um, uncontroversial um, position that I'm outlining here. Um, and what I'm, what I'm going to talk about is the primary division between left and right in Israel. Um, now, the majority of Israelis in every election, more or less, are voting for two or three parties, two or three big parties. And then everyone else is voting for smaller parties at the margins. Um, so for most of Israeli history, you had a dominant centre-left party, which was the Labour Party, formerly called, formerly Mapai, and a dominant centre-right party, the Likud, formerly the Herut Party. Um, and you can see here on the, in the picture, David Ben-Gurion and Menachem Begin, who were the legendary founding leaders of those two parties. Um, and until around, uh, let's say, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, somewhere between half and two thirds of Israelis are voting for one of those two parties. Other Israelis are voting for smaller parties on very specific issues, like issue-based parties or demographic-based parties like the ultra-Orthodox parties, for example. To try and illustrate this to, a, a, to an audience of people who are coming from countries that have two or three parties, let's say the American system, which has two parties, or the British system, which has three or more, but really two main parties. Um, let's imagine that, let's take the United States, Right. And let's imagine that the Israeli system is suddenly transplanted to the United States. <laughs> that would be a shock for everyone. But let's imagine that happens. Right. So instead of having just two parties, you have two main parties. Right. That represent a basic sense of what conservatism and liberalism is in the American context. Let's call them Republicans and Democrats. But then you'd also have smaller parties on the right and the left that are addressing particular issues within those parties, right? If you look at, let's say, take, if we take the United States, right, the Republican Party today and the Democratic Party today are big coalitions that address all kinds of different issues, economic issues, social issues, cultural issues. So in this imaginary multi-party America, right, you would have smaller parties on the right. Let's say you'd have a libertarian party, that is pushing for smaller government and doesn't think the Republican Party is, uh, is, um, is strong enough on this issue. You might have a Second Amendment party that doesn't think the, that's worried that the Republican Party might go soft on, on, um, on guns. Um, uh, a pro-life party that is worried the Republican Party is, that is, wants to keep the Republican Party really strong on overturning Roe v. Wade. And on the left, you'd have the same thing, right? You might have a Socialist Party that's pushing more left-wing economics, uh, a pro-choice party, right, an anti, uh, um, like a stronger gun control party, that kind of thing, right? So specific issue-based parties. And if it's really going to mimic Israel, you'd also have demographic parties, maybe a Latino party or an African-American party. I don't know. But you get the sense, right? Now, in Israel, you have a completely different set of issues, right? Those issues that I mentioned there, uh, firearms, abortion, th th these are not issues in, the, in Israeli politics, right? They're not on the, on the political radar in Israel at all, um, but other issues are, right? Other issues are the role of religion in the state, exemptions for ultra-Orthodox uh, citizens from the army. These are issues which, um, which are major issues in Israeli society and which do pr prompt the emergence of single issue or, or, or narrow focused smaller parties. Okay, so let's talk about these traditional two, these two main parties that most Israelis were voting for. So until, until around 1974, um, it's kind of a traditional left-right thing, right? Like you get in most countries, socialist v. capitalist, or let's say big government v. small government, um, uh, high tax, low tax, those, those issues that we're all familiar with from the countries that we come from. Um, you have uh, a socialist party, um, Mapai uh, against a, cap a capitalist party, Herut, which then becomes the Kurd. Um, and some of you will know that Labour was Israel was dominated by the Labour Party until 1977, when the Likud um, get into power for the first time with Menachem Begin. 
Um, and by the time that happens, however, by the time the Likud comes in 1977, the political ground has shifted. And we can say, more or less, that the main political divide in Israel since the 1970s, increasingly the 1980s, and then really reaching kind of fever pitch and actual um, sort of really um, fierce opposition, oppositional antagonistic politics in the 1990s, is the issue of um, Palestinians, settlements, uh, two-state solution or not, um, giving up territory or not, right? And these are the issues which divide people. And we tend, and, and, and usually these days, when people talk about left and right, that's what they mean in Israel. Most of the time when you hear someone saying Smolani or Yemeni, left or right, they're usually talking about the position on that issue. A Smolani Israeli is someone who believes in a two-state solution, in evacuating most of the settlements, um, establishing a Palestinian state, et cetera, et cetera. A Yemeni person is opposed to those things, supports the settlement movement gen as a generalization, right? Um, so, and the, the shorthand for that tended to be peace camp, the peace camp and the national camp, which is kind of unfair because right-wingers were also interested in peace and left-wingers were also patriotic about the state. But those were the... The, uh, the, the, the that was the shorthand that was given. Um, now, by 2009, this has changed for a, a, a whole lot of reasons, which I don't want to go into at length because it would take too long. But let's just say that um, the the old left wing positions on um, the peace process, on a Palestinian state, on um, evacuating settlements in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, um, have become um, essentially not, essentially become a non-issue in Israeli elections. Not because everyone support, not because everyone um, uh, is a, has suddenly become opposed to, to a Palestinian state and left-wing idea, but because no one thinks it's realistic anymore, at least for the foreseeable future, right? So you have the failure of, you have multiple failures in the peace process. You have the second intifada. You have... Palestinian leaders, two different Palestinian leaders rejecting three different um, peace offers. Uh, you have Israel withdrawing from Gaza in an attempt to um, empower moderate Palestinians and instead it empowers Hamas, who take over the Gaza Strip. Um, and essentially, that becomes a non-issue Israeli politics. And you have this kind of consensus emerging in Israeli society, which unites both those people who are always opposed to um, a Palestinian state uh, and giving up territory with those people who are in principle in favor of it, um, but don't believe that there's actually any chance of it happening anytime soon because there's no um, real partner on the other side, that there's no Palestinian leadership that's willing to make those, um, to, that's willing to, 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 uh, to sign a deal with Israel, at least a deal which Israel could accept. So what happens instead is that that issue fades away as an election issue. And all the elections since then, since 2009, have been about um, different domestic issues or often personalities. Increasingly, I would say personalities. And we'll talk in a minute about why the personality of specifically of Netanyahu has become the dominant issue. Um, but, for example, um, I'd say the most... Um, uh, I think useful example is that in the election of 2013, the cost of living economics um, was a was a major issue in the election um, because two years before you'd had huge protests on the streets of Israel about the cost of um, buying a property, the cost of basic goods, the fact that um, the Israeli economy, although it was growing and was looking good from the perspective of GDP wasn't working for many people, that many people weren't, their, 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 their paychecks weren't going far enough. Um, and so you saw the emergence of, for example, a new party called Yesh Atid, which ran uh, largely on a platform of addressing the cost of living and did extremely well as a new party and has continued, continued to do reasonably well. Um, and, um, and that was that was a, that was a kind of break from 
uh, what had been the, the, the norm in Israeli politics for a long time, right, where the conflict and security and the issue of the Palestinians was the was the main issue. Um, OK, so where are we? So where are we today? Right. Where are we today going into these into these elections? I'm putting it like this to Bibi or not to Bibi. That is the question. Um, now, the three men on the right, Naftali Bennett, Yair Lapid, and Gidon Saar, uh, all believe that they can and should be prime minister instead of Netanyahu. And if Netanyahu is not prime minister after this election, one of these three men will be. That's for sure. There's no one else. There's no one else in the running, right? We can talk a bit about what their actual chances are, each of these three candidates, but um, but they're the only they're the only viable options if, if it's not Netanyahu. Um, Netanyahu, the government was dissolved in December, and Netanyahu gave a very um, confident speech. Um, the, the government fell largely because of Netanyahu. Okay, that Netanyahu essentially not directly but indirectly dissolved the government, um, and the elections are there and you could ask why did he why did he go to elections now uh, he's very politically astute he wouldn't go to elections if he didn't think he could win them and the reality is that he probably did think um that he would that he had a, that he had a very good chance um because he was um calling these elections off the back of firstly the abraham accords uh, the the uh, uh peace agreements or normalization agreements really with um with uh, the uae and bahrain and subsequently with Morocco and Sudan. Um, and these were universally popular across Israel and Netanyahu got a lot of credit um, for making them happen. And also the coronavirus vaccine rollout, um, which as you know, has sort of catapulted Israel to the top of the rankings in terms of its vaccination, um, uh, its vaccination operation. Um, and on the, off the back of those two things, Netanyahu presumably thought fairly confident, felt, felt very confident about the election. Um, what he what he didn't anticipate was, and the big sort of bombshell uh, of this election cycle was Gidon Saar, this guy here, um, who was a Likud senior member of the Likud and um, former minister in the Likud, left the Likud to form his own party called um, uh, Tikva Chadasha, A New Hope, um, which caused a lot of Star Wars memes. For those of you familiar with. The, the titles of the, the title of the original Star Wars film, um, and um, and Sar Sar left with a um, a withering criticism of Netanyahu, in which he basically said that um, uh, he's you know essentially I'm not leaving the Likud the Likud left me that the Likud is not the party that it used to be that Netanyahu has turned it into something else and he is going to create a new party which is the real um, uh, the real Likud, the real what the Likud should be, and the Netanyahu has essentially pursued a personal um, agenda, uh, and there were other members of the Likud who joined Sar in this new party, and so for the first time in this, you know, this this now run of four elections, Netanyahu is not just facing rivals on the centre left, but he's also facing is facing significant rivalry within the right wing, within his own right wing camp. Um, and that could that 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 certainly poses um, a new a new problem a new problem for him. Um, so now we can look. We can say that the issue uh, it's not the only issue. There are other issues as well. But the fundamental issue that most um, Israeli voters are are, um, are asking themselves before they get to which party am I going to vote for is do I want Netanyahu as prime minister or do I not? If I do then there's a few parties I am going to choose between. And if I don't want him as prime minister, then there's, these, then there's another set of parties that I'm going to choose between, right? Um, okay. Now, um, these are the parties. Uh, these aren't all the parties running. As I said, there's lots of parties running. Um, you know what? Let me just check the chat. Um, Someone asked to repeat the names of the other candidates. Naftali Bennett, Yair Lapid, Gidon Saar. And I'll also talk more about them and their parties in a, in a, in a, short, in a short while. Um, okay, so uh, I haven't included here, I've, oh, let me say it differently. I've only included here 
parties which are um, which will either definitely or very possibly um, make it across the electoral threshold. So parties that are polling well under the 3.25%, I'm not including here, okay? Um, so what I wanna do, uh, I don't wanna take up too much time because I wanna leave time for questions, um, but let me just briefly run through these parties, more or less, just a very, very short few, uh, if, no more than sort of, <laughs> sort of 10 seconds or so on each. But I just want to give you a sense of them. And in the questions, if you want to find, if you want to know more about each party, then we can do that. So let's, we'll take these, the centre-left Arab bloc uh, first. Um, so Yesh Atid, led by a former journalist called Yair Lapid, formed around 10 years ago, as I said, um, in the wake of the um, cost of living protests. Basically, they're, they're off, they define themselves as not as a left party, but as a centre party. They take a quite a hawkish line on security issues. Um, they do support a two-state solution, but their, their position is basically kind of with the consensus, right? So they're, they're going along with, with the Israeli consensus that um, it's not, this is not going to happen anytime soon. So we're not making it our main issue. We think that two states is probably the, the, most, the, the, the best outcome at the end of the day, but that's not, it's not going to happen in the foreseeable future. So we're going to focus on other issues. And those issues are, as I said, the cost of living, clean government, right? They're increasingly, especially in the wake of Netanyahu's um, criminal cases, uh, they, their platform is a lot about um, addressing corruption uh, in government, trans greater transparency uh, in government. They're also socially liberal. Uh, they focus a lot on things like women's rights and uh, LGBT rights. Um, and they're also, they also have a major plank around religion and state, right? So they want to for example, uh, they want they basically they, they want to have a more pluralist, religiously pluralist Israel. So, for example, they support um, uh, having um, transport on Shabbat in in cities where there is a majority secular population and where where it basically it's for it to be decided locally. Right at present, um, uh, transport is not is not public transport is not available on Shabbat. Um, in, in, except in uh, some Arab areas. Um, and yes, he believes that that should be decided by the local municipalities and that a city where there is a small, where there is a large secular population, they should have that. So that's an example. Okay. Um, uh, the joint list, by the way, this is an order of polling numbers, right? So yes, is, is polling the highest of these, of these, of this block. Joint list is the joint Arab list. Right. It's a it's a it's, an, it's a, an amalgam of three different Arab parties. There, there are actually four Arab parties running. The fourth one used to be in the joint list. It's now running separately. It's at the bottom of this list. It's called Ram. Um, and they're basically they're, they actually disagree on a bunch of things. Um, some of them are secular. Some of them are religious. Um, some of them are, ve are very, very left wing, even Marxist. Um, others are not. Um, but they're but they they they're they're. What unites them is that they claim to represent the Arab population of Israel in its in its the specific issues that it faces as an as the Arab minority in Israel. Whether they do that successfully or not is another question. Labour is, of course, the historic left wing party which has fallen on hard times. Um, it's currently led by Mirav Michaeli, who's a former journalist uh, and um, a prominent uh, feminist activist. Um, they support two states and negotiated peace with the Palestinians. Um, they're very much opposed to the settlement uh, movement. Um, and they also believe in a more social democratic economic policy, more government um, and more, uh, more of a government role in reducing the cost of living. Um, Meretz is the left wing party, traditionally the party to the left of Labour. So basically everything I just said about Labour, but further to the left, Essentially, the truth is that with Mirav Michaeli running Labour, it's hard to, to really find a distinction between them these days. That wasn't the case when Labour was, was led by more hawkish uh, figures. There were, there were times when there were, there were more kind of security-minded leaders of the Labour Party. These days, Mirav Michaeli could easily, I think, be a merits politician. So it's hard really to, 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 to find a distinction between them. Um, merits, I would say, historically... Um, have focused a lot on uh, issues of, on cultural issues like um, women's rights, gay rights, minority rights. 
Um, and maybe you could say that's more of a focus for them than it is with Labour, but I don't think there's much of a disagreement between them on those things. Um, blue and white. Um, so blue and white is the party of Benny Gantz. And the reason they're polling so badly, having initially been this big party, is because um, it's not really clear what they stand for. Right in the last elections, they 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 basically merged with the Eshatid and they ran with the Eshatid and they essentially adopted the Eshatid's platform. So it's not clear what their distinctive platform is, um, other than the fact that Benny Gantz is the leader, and it's essentially a platform for Benny Gantz. Uh, so if you think that Benny Gantz, as some people do, not a very large number, given looking at the polls, but as some people do, is this basically this decent, patriotic uh, Israeli who's a former chief of staff of the IDF. Um, and you think he's someone that should that we should have in the Knesset? Okay. Other people, it, probably an increasing number of people, see him as naive for going in for going into the coalition with Netanyahu. Um, but that's there's not that much to say distinctive to say about Blue and White. I would say, other than the fact that they're you know they're broadly speaking a centre party along similar lines to Yeshati. Ram is the is the Arab party that is not part of the joint list. Um, that is. Um, uh, it's an Islam, it's an Islamic party, um, very socially conservative, um, and I think disagreed with other Arab parties on some of those issues. Also, actually, it disagreed with on an interesting tactical issue, which was that they actually said that they would be willing to um, to do a deal with Netanyahu in order to get more um, influence in the government. And the rest of the Arab party said we don't want anything to do with Netanyahu. So that was there was also a a kind of boycott Netanyahu or not boycott Netanyahu divide between them, which is also interesting. Moving on to the other side, Likud, um, the traditional centre-right party, um, uh, support for the settlement movement uh, in principle, um, not always in practice. It can be, it can sometimes been pragmatic on that. Um, and that's sometimes where it's been criticised by other right-wing parties. Um, but it's a historic, successful political party the most successful party of the past 40 years, certainly, in Israel, since it came to power in 1977. It's basically been the uh, leading party uh, in Israel for um, three quarters of that time, um, pretty much. Um, it has a very large and loyal base. Um, people that have always, there's a lot of people that vote for Likud because they've always voted for Likud. Um, which is not dissimilar, I think, in many countries where you have a successful party. Um, and Netanyahu's success, personal success, has been to has been connected to his ability to project um, that image of the, the sort of stable security and, of course, his longevity, right? He's Israel's longest serving prime minister. He's been prime minister now for 12 years straight. Um, so there's that he has that going for him for many people. It's also a drawback for other people, right? Um, depends where you stand, but but certainly for some people that's that's a big plus. Um, now, New Hope, which is Giron Sara's party, as I said, um, was established to be the kind of alternative to Likud because the because the critique by Sar and the other Likudniks who left um, was that um, basically that the Likud is no longer what it used to be; that it's become a a vehicle for Netanyahu's personal agenda um, and that personal agenda according to the, crit the critique is basically staying in power as long as possible um, for uh, base for putting his own personal interests ahead of the ahead of the ideology of the party um, and that's that's the that's that's the sort of criticism of of uh, by the new hope but but it's a right-wing party um, it's committed to the settlement project uh, it's hard line on security issues but it is but Unlike one could say, um, Likud these days, the way in which it would it would claim to be more of the sort of old Likud um, is it's it's liberal on um, it's liberal on issues of individual rights uh, on the rule of law, um, which is things which are all, which were always very important to the Likud historically and perhaps have been less important in recent years under Netanyahu. Arguably, that's the that's certainly the criticism. Um, uh, I'm just going to take a break to look at some questions quickly. Okay, you know what? I'm going to take these afterwards because I want to. I just want to press on. Um, 
but I promise I won't ignore any of these questions. Um, the Religious Zionist Party, sorry, Yamina, I miss Yamina. Yamina is led by Naftali Bennett, who's a former defense minister and a former um, education minister. Um, Bennett uh, is, Bennett is, although Yamina is a, is a right-wing party that's, that is very much, um, very much um, identified with uh, the settlement, settlements in the West Bank and even um, annexing parts of the West Bank. Um, Bennett has actually stressed in this campaign that the priority is rebuilding the economy um, after the pandemic. And he's attracted a lot of support from people that aren't necessarily in line with him politically because he was seen as taking a very proactive stand over the past year or so on the corona issue and criticizing the government from the opposition um, for not doing enough on certain things. And, and Bennett, I think, has, 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 has impressed a lot of people as a leader uh, for that reason. Um, but certainly politically and ideologically, he's very much on the right. Um, he, uh, another major issue of Yamina is um, around the Supreme Court and the accusation that the Supreme Court is too uh, is um, engaged in judicial activism, is too involved in the uh, democratic process uh, and needs to be reined in. And so they, they very much support legislation which would um, decrease the independence of the Supreme Court. Um, depending on your point of view, either from their perspective, it's an important measure to, uh, to give the, um, the Democratic representatives, the Knesset, greater power over the unelected judges of the Supreme Court, or on the opposite side of the argument, um, it's a dangerous measure which would prevent the Supreme Court from um, uh, protecting minorities and other uh, and uh, uh, equal rights issues, which could be um, um, at risk if the if the majority is, is allowed a kind of uh, a free reign without any checks and balances. We can talk more about that if you want. Okay, religious Zionist party. Um, okay, so this is not the old religious Zionist movement, right? The the um, the national religious. Um, the National Religious Party. Um, it's a, that party doesn't really exist anymore. The Religious Zionist Party is, a, is basically a new party established by a guy called Bertelos Smotrich, who's a very hardline right-wing figure who used to be the leader of the most right-wing faction in, um, in, a, in, a, in a broader coalition of right-wing parties. Um, and it's now even more right-wing because um, under, actually under pressure from Netanyahu, it merged with two smaller um, far-right, I think it's fair to say, um, parties, Otsma Yudit, which is a successor party to uh, Mayor Kahana's Kath party, if anyone is familiar with that, um, and Noam, which is a very small fringe far-right party whose main issue is basically anti-gay rights. That's its kind of agenda. Um, so that's, that's the Religious Science Party. Um, then we come to Shas and United Torah Judaism, but these are the two uh, Haredi, the two ultra-Orthodox parties. Shas is the Sephardi um, uh, Mizrahi um, ultra-Orthodox party and United Torah Judaism, the Ashkenazi one. Um, these are parties which are, um, they're, they're kind of single issue parties, right? They're, they're, they, they focus on the needs of their constituents um, in an incredibly focused way, and that's been their success. That way, they, they get into coalition after coalition after coalition because they say, we, these are what we want. We want exemption from the army. We want funding for our, our um, yeshivot and, and stipends for our men who are going to be studying in Kollel and not working. Um, they're very socially conservative, as you would imagine. Uh, they're very much opposed to any measures to um, uh, open up uh, the religious system uh, in any way uh, and are for that reason very unpopular on the more liberal side of the of the uh, of the aisle um, but those are the those are the the two parties and and importantly they are the most loyal have become the most loyal um, parties to for Netanyahu the most loyal coalition allies of the Likud. Um, Yisra Beitenu is an interesting one. Yisra Beitenu um, was established by Avigdor Lieberman a former defense minister, foreign minister. Uh, it's basically as a party for 
immigrants from the former Soviet Union. Now, it's 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 formally a right wing party, and it's and historically it's taken very right wing positions, especially on um, especially on security. It's been very hard line on security. It's often criticised Netanyahu for not being hard enough, to, for not taking a tougher line against Hamas, those kinds of things. Um, but it's very liberal on one specific issue, which is religion and state, because its constituents. Um, the million and a half, two million or so um, immigrants from the former Soviet Union and their children and now grandchildren are, tend to be either secular or in some cases not regarded as Jewish by the, by the rabbinate. Um, and so um, Yisrael Beitenu, uh, it's in their constituents' interest to have a much more liberal system, much more liberal religious system, a much less coercive system of the rabbinate and less power for the orthodox rabbis so and this by the way was the issue which collapsed the government way back when this whole cycle of four elections started which was that Yisra Beitenu insisted on drafting um, uh, Haredim to the army um, and the Haredi parties refused and so Netanyahu couldn't make a coalition because this right wing party, which Yisra Beitenu, which was supposed to be part of his coalition, part of his bloc, wouldn't sit with the Haredi parties that, would all, that were also part of his coalition. OK, now there, I had another couple of slides, but I'm, I, I want to go to questions. Um, and if, if um, there are questions which don't address the things I wanted to say there, then I will, then I will get to that. Uh, so let me, let me go to some of the questions that are in the chat, and then I'm going to open it out to people. Um, so let's see what we have here. So um, is voting obligatory? No, it is not. Why is Israel still using paper ballots? Good question. I don't know. Um, uh, I think it, it's just, I think it's just a traditional thing. Uh, I think a lot of countries do. I think the UK still does. Um, I think plenty of countries do. I think for Americans, it's strange because America, for, because most states in America don't. But I think a lot of countries in Europe also still use paper ballots. Um, why is the threshold fractional and not integral, e.g. 3.7%, 3 not 4%? Um, so I think it was tied to a certain number of seats rather than uh, needing to be a round number. I think that's the reason. Um, um, bum, 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 bum. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, regarding Gidon Saar, aren't there some issues not so flattering to him that he's done such a, as hiring for his campaign the notorious, extremely anti-Trump Lincoln project. Okay, so there was a there was a controversy that um, Gidon Saar hired um, the Lincoln project or, or members of the Lincoln project to be advisors on his campaign, um, consultants on his campaign. It's not at all unusual for Israeli parties to hire American political consultants. It's something that started in the 1990s, and these days it happens. Netanyahu, every election, they could always use, there's one or two favored American consultants that Netanyahu uses, um, Yesha Tid, use, um, use American um, elect, election uh, strategists. So it's not unusual. The fact they chose the Lincoln Project was nothing to do with them being anti-Trump. So it's not a, there was no, they, they, they simply, they wanted them because they thought they did a, a I guess they thought they did a good job in their mission of, on, on, of um, um, harnessing conservative, anti-Trump conservative um, support, I guess. Um, and you can see why, by the way, because part of their agenda, of course, of New Hope's agenda is getting right-wing voters who have previously voted for could to vote for them. So you can see where they would make an analogy with uh, a, um, a group that were getting um, Republican voters not to vote Republican this time around, right? Um, how much will Netanyahu's court case impact on Israeli voters? This is a really good question. So Basically, it's a very divisive issue. Um, roughly half the country, basically the half of the country that don't want Netanyahu to be prime minister, um, think that it is an absolute disgrace that you have a man who is currently um, facing three counts of corruption, including one of bribery, um, sitting in the prime minister's office. Legally, he can do it because there's nothing in Israeli law that says that he can't. But their position is like, it's crazy. Like, how can this be? This is like banana republic stuff. Like, how can, a, how can you have, a, you know, any other, anyone else would have stepped down, right? On the other side, 
are people who either who either think who either buy into Netanyahu's narrative, which is that it's a witch hunt, that it's a conspiracy against him, or they don't necessarily think that, but they think, you know what, regardless of that, we still think Netanyahu is the best man for the job. We still think he's done such a good job as prime minister over the years that he's been there and no one else can come close to him. None of the other candidates can come close to him. So we still want Netanyahu despite that. Um, and people have pretty much made up their minds about it. I don't think anything is going to happen between now and the election. It's, and, it, and it really is a very kind of 50-50 thing, maybe 55-45, whatever. Like you can see in the election results, you know, the, the parties that want Netanyahu to be prime minister versus the parties that don't want him to be prime minister. It's, you know, it's 59 to 61 or 58 to 62 seats in the Knesset. It's very evenly divided. Um, why is Yeshotid as popular as it appears to be? What does it have to speak for itself? Didn't Yair Lapid do very poorly when he was a member of Knesset? I th okay, so he's been a member of Knesset for the whole time. I think you mean as a minister. I assume you mean as a minister. Um, so when Lapid, Lapid was minister for two years, he was finance minister. Um, certainly he was, I think the consensus is that he was not a great finance minister. Um, but firstly, it's not, I mean, I don't think most people, for most people that's not, or for a lot of people, let's say, that's not so important. Like you could, just because you weren't great as finance minister, doesn't mean you're not going to be a good prime minister. The two things are not, don't necessarily require the same skill set or the same knowledge, whatever. Um, but also um, it's popular because look, the left, as I said, is, is, has gone down, right? So the party that best represents, the party that most consistently, let's say, represents that, um, that portion of Israel, that section of Israel, which wants a more liberal, um, more open, more pluralist, um, less, um, less religious Israel, or certainly less power to the religious authorities, Israel, Yeshatid is the main address for them these days. Um, it doesn't have the baggage that some of the left-wing parties have of being seen as naive about the Palestinians or soft on security, whether that's a fair accusation or not. Because Yeshatid, as well as being liberal on all those issues, is actually quite hard, is actually quite hawkish on security stuff. So it fits quite well. Um, with um, a large section of the Israeli public. So I think that's the basic answer to that question. Um, um, bum, 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 bum. Is new hope to the right of Likud regarding settling Eretz Israel? To the right of Likud. It would be fair to say, I think, that Gidon Saar has been more consistently right-wing on this issue than Netanyahu. Netanyahu has often been quite pragmatic on the issue, for example, um, freezing settlement building at the behest of um, President Obama at uh, one point. Um, now, critic, critic, right-wing critics of Netanyahu say that he's soft on this issue, um, that, he's too, he, that he's, too, he's too pragmatic, he's not ideological enough, he's not tough enough on it, and they would say, they might say that Gidon Saar is a better bet for that issue. Um, Defenders of Netanyahu would say that when you're prime minister, you have to deal with things. You just have to deal with things in a more pragmatic way. You can't be so ideological. You have to look at the bigger picture. And that might mean that you have to compromise on things in a way that the Gidon Sar hasn't had to do because he was never prime minister. Um, but yeah, Gidon Sar certainly claims and his supporters claim that he's to the right of Netanyahu on these things. Um, I read that Gidon Saar does not favor the two-state solution. That is true. They absolutely expressly do not. Um, would this make not make them more right-wing than Likud? Look, Likud's position on two states is kind of ambiguous. Netanyahu in the past has said he supports two states, and then he said he didn't, and then he said he did. And it kind of, basically what Netanyahu, I think the fairest way to, put, to say it would be the Netanyahu Netanyahu's ideal scenario is that we do reach a point where we can change the status quo in Judea and Samaria, where we are no longer um, um, involved, so involved in the in Palestinian affairs. We're not ruling um, uh, even indirectly 
um, Palestinians, but he doesn't want to evacuate settlements. So, for example, if anyone knows what the, the map that, that the Trump, what, what Trump called the deal of the century, the Trump peace plan, what that looked like, that is pretty similar to the map you can imagine Netanyahu drawing. OK, many people think that he basically did draw it. I mean, that, that it was drawn, that, that it was drawn up by Jared Kushner and others in the Trump administration, very much in collaboration with Netanyahu and Netanyahu's people. Um, right. So that Israel, so that Israel would keep all the settlements. You'd have a Palestinian. You can call it a state. You can not call it a state. It would be uh, independent, but it would but it wouldn't be a contiguous state, right? In the, in the, it wouldn't be something that in the traditional sense of a, when, we, when we've talked about two states in the past. Um, party membership, how many people belong to each party? No, Israelis are not required to be members of a party. You can choose to be a member of a party and then that means that you get to, um, depending on the party, some parties have primaries, some don't. It, uh, Likud has primaries, for example, Labour has primaries, um, and then you can vote uh, for the party list. Um, if Netanyahu were to step down because he's accused, then, then that means one only has to be accused to not be able to run. The prosecutors would be in charge of controlling elections. It's a fair comment. Right, look, so currently in Israeli law, every minister except prime minister has to step down if he's indicted. Not just charged, indicted, right? So if you actually, it's not enough to be charged. If you actually have a court case pending, then you can't, you can't, stay, you can't stay on as a minister. Prime Minister is the only position where that is not the case, which is which Netanyahu um, 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 kept to. So, um, so look, Netanyahu would agree with you, Lib, Lib Sher, who asked this question, right? He would say, and his supporters would say, it can't be that just because, like, the prosecutors think this, that, um, that you're not able to, to, um, to stand, to stay on as Prime Minister. The counter-argument is, I think, or one of the counter-arguments is, firstly, that um, that, it can't, that you can't be, uh, an individual, however gifted, can't be expected to be able to run the country, especially a country as complicated as Israel, if they are having to deal with a court case, basically negotiating like, put the, with, the, with the possibility they could end up in prison, right? That, that's like a major personal stress and tension and, and attention that someone has to deal with in their lives. And you can't expect someone facing that to also be able to deal with the matters of state. Um, uh, and this, by the way, was an accusation that Netanyahu himself leveled at Ehud Olmert. When Ehud Olmert was, in, was facing an, uh, an, uh, being indicted, um, before he was even indicted, Netanyahu, as leader of the opposition, said that Olmert should step down for that reason, which of course has been thrown at Netanyahu since. Um, uh, how much influence do the Arab parties have with the Palestinians? Not really much at all, uh, is the short answer to that. Uh, the Palestinian, Palestinians uh, living in the, in the Gaza and the West Bank are very much distinct politically, maybe not, not ethnically, of course, but politically from um, the Arab, the Israeli Arab and their parties. Um, there are Arab parties, there are Arab members of Knesset that support the very much vocally, openly support the Palestinian cause. That's another issue, but they don't really have an influence. Did Israel give up annexation to get to the Abraham Accords? Because that's a little off topic, but the short answer is yes. So for the, for the, for the foreseeable future, for the foreseeable future. Um, by the way, Giron Saar, when asked about this, because Saar, as I said, presents himself as a right-wing figure, right? Um, who supports settlements and whatever. So he said, okay, so you must support annexation. And Saar very, um, you could say politically astutely or diplomatically or whatever, said, look, yes, we support annexation. I want annexation. But Netanyahu signed these accords. And part of those accords, part of the understanding is, according to the UAE, that Israel will not um, proceed with annexation, at least until I think it's, I think it's three years, four years, something like that. Um, and um, uh, and so, I, so if I'm prime minister, I will, of course, hold to that agreement because you don't just go back on an agreement that your predecessor signed. So Saar is basically saying that he wants annexation, but he accepts that it's not going to happen because of the Abraham Accords. 
at least for the time being. Um, this is a very good question. <laughs> what party represents the modern orthodox, says Robin Gottlieb. The short answer is no one, I think. And um, also modern orthodox is a kind of problematic term in Israel because modern orthodox in the, dias in the diaspora sense isn't exactly synonymous with the national religious uh, movement in Israel. Similar, right? Not ultra-Orthodox, um, but, it's, but it's not exactly the same. But let's say they're broadly equivalent. So, so which is the party of the national religious movement? Now, it, you, there used to be a party, a specific party representing that movement, the National Religious Party, called Mafdal in Hebrew, an acronym um, from the Flegat Datilomi, the National Religious Party. Um, it no longer exists. Um, it's a kind of, it's one of the um, uh, sort of most curious developments in Israeli politics. And brought, I mean, the, who did, I mean, national, modern Orthodox, it's not a monolithic group, of course, right? They tend to vote right. They tend to be right wing in their politics. I think, um, I don't want to get the, don't quote me exactly on this, but I would, but I think around 75, 80% of them would define themselves as right wing. And so, they, so they're going to vote for Likud, or they might vote for, this, the, 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 for Yamina. The, what is called the Religious Zionist Party, Smotrich's party, is much further to the right. Uh, and I would say much further to the right than most people that define themselves as modern Orthodox. Um, okay. Are Israeli Arabs increasingly seeing their issues as being different from those in the Shomon and Gaza? Or do they see themselves as representing them in the Shomon and Gaza? Um, you know, their issues are very different. They're citizens of Israel. They, have, they face very, very different issues. Um, their issues are increasingly, uh, firstly, domestic issues, things like crime. There's very, very serious crime um, problems in Israeli Arab towns, and they're accusation, which I think is a fair accusation, is that there's not adequate policing in those areas. Um, there's issues of investment, of underinvestment in the Arab sector, uh, issues of discrimination, which is the accusation. And I, this is not the forum where I'm going to talk about how fair or unfair that is, but it's certainly there. Um, and um, yeah, so that's, uh, those are all the questions on the chat. Do people have questions they want to ask me now or, or can I go to the other slides that I wanted to go to? What's the consensus? Uh, how am I going to get to a consensus? You know what? No, okay, there's, I'm going to, okay, there's one question here that someone's written. I'm going to answer this question, then I'm going to go to the slides. In the event Netanyahu loses, do you think his supporters will accept the legitimacy of the outcome or is there a real risk they will go the way of Trump supporters? And if so, how does that affect Israeli democracy? Goodness. Um, okay. There is definitely, there have definitely been people who say that they are worried that Netanyahu, so the Netanyahu supporters will not accept the outcome and the Netanyahu will quote unquote do a Trump and sort of call for people to protest and, you know, see where that goes. The reason they say that is because Netanyahu's um, behavior over the past two years has, has certainly in some respect modeled itself on Trump in the way that he has gone after the press, gone after um, the judiciary, uh, his political enemies in, in ways which is actually very unusual for an Israeli prime minister to do. It's not that there haven't been other Israeli politicians that have done this, but not as prime minister. Um, and um, it's and he's attracted a lot of criticism, by the way, that that is one of the things when you if you look at the criticism that Netanyahu attracts from both the left, let Yesh Atid, certainly and others, but also now um, Gidon Saar and, and, and New Hope, who the, the sort of uh, um, refuseniks from the Likud, the refugees from the Likud. Um, that's one of their criticisms, right? The Netanyahu has pursued a, um, a sort of populist um, demagogic policy, right? Which has incited and inflamed uh, tensions in Israeli society. So the people that, that make those accusations have, have raised that concern. Do I think it would happen? 
I think I think Israel's not America. For all the things, BB isn't Trump, um, and it's a different situation. Um, I don't want to speculate. I, I I don't personally. I don't think it would happen. Um, I hope it won't happen. Um, let's you know. Let's let's wait and see. Let's wait and see. Um, Okay, uh, Susan Brown has asked a question, which I will get to, but I want to get to my slides, okay? Because I said I would. Um, okay. Now, I talked about the ideological divide, center-left, right, religious, but this is the divide that really matters. Anti-Nessinyar, pro Nessinyar. So you can see um, that, so the, um, these are the, the parties on the, the anti Netanyahu camp, on the, on the pro Netanyahu camp. Yamina's in the middle. Why isn't Yamina in the middle? Because Yamina hasn't committed. It's the only party that hasn't, where you can't say for, with any certainty that it, that it, is, um, that it is pro anti Netanyahu. Naftali Bennett has said, firstly, Naftali Bennett has said that he sees himself as a prime ministerial candidate and he wants to replace Netanyahu. But he's not ruling out sitting in a Netanyahu coalition. Netanyahu led coalition. These other parties have. Yes, Otita said they won't sit. Merits, Labour, Blue and White, Ramu, Hope, they won't sit in a coalition with, with Netanyahu. These parties, they could, religious Zionists, obviously they could. Religious Zionist parties, Shas United Story Judaism, not only um, have said they will, but that's their that's their preference. And in fact, religious Zionist party could probably only sit in a Netanyahu coalition because the other candidates. Um, well, if it's Bennett, I guess. Basically, Yesha Tid and, and, and uh, New Hope have said they won't sit in a coalition with the Religious Zionist Party because it's too extreme. It's too far to the right. Um, so that's the, that's the, th this is the divide that I think that's really going to count after the election. Um, and that's what's going to, and, and the question of what happens um, after the election is, is, I mean, there's no, this is why it's so, it's so difficult to predict what will happen. Um, now, it's going to be difficult for Netanyahu to form a government because he needs, he's going to need for these four parties and Yamina to get to 61. Currently, the polls have them as a little short of that. The polls could be wrong. They've been wrong before <laughs> and they could change. But if the polls are right, um, then he's not going to be able to form a coalition, probably. Um, the question is, can the other side form a coalition? The, they have the numbers, but the problem they have is that this is a very ideologically diverse group of parties, right? In normal circumstances, it's very hard to see how New Hope, where are they? New Hope and Yamina, two right-wing pro-settlement parties, would sit with Labour and Merits, certainly with Merits. Um, Merits is, you know, it's the most uh, consistently ideologically opposed left wing party opposed to the settlements and opposed to uh, um, and in favor of leaving um, Judea and Samaria as a matter of urgency. Right. It's hard to see how that would work. Stranger things have happened in Israeli politics, but it is hard to see how it would work. Um, now, this is, I'm just going to play, just kind of play this out for you. This is the poll. There's actually been a more recent poll than this, um, but this is the poll from 27th of February, which is Friday, Saturday. Um, now, uh, the red, the parties in red are the parties in the pro Netanyahu camp. In blue is the anti Netanyahu camp, and I put Yamina in purple. You can see here a possible coalition of 62. Yes, I tell you, New Hope, Yes, I tell you, Labour, Blue and White, Merits and Yamina. But for that to happen, as I said, you would need to have Merits and Yamina agreeing to sit with each other. Not easy. Netanyahu falls just short. Um, he gets to 60. One short. Um, now, all it would take for this to be dramatically different would be if if either merits or blue and white or both don't get don't don't go past the threshold because then um, the numbers change and it's very very easy to see the Netanyahu gets that one extra seat that he needs 
So it's very, very difficult. It's very, it's difficult to see. It's very difficult to speculate what's going to happen because it so there are so many variables, uh, including, as I said, who does and doesn't get past the threshold, um, and also which way Yamina goes. Imagine a scenario, for example, which is possible, where either the anti Netanyahu coalition, headed by either Lapid or Saar, and the Netanyahu coalition, headed by Netanyahu, can get to 61 with Yamina. So Bennett has a choice. The, the most obvious thing would be for him to go with Netanyahu, that it's a, he's right wing, it's a right wing coalition. But it's not a given for a couple of reasons. One, there's very, very bad blood between them personally. Bennett was, has been treated very badly by Netanyahu, like personally. And, that, and he could sort of, it could be a sort of revenge thing, who knows? Um, although he could play a political price for that. His vote, certainly his voters would want him to go with Netanyahu. Who knows? Right. Um, I have more questions here. That's the end of my slideshow. Um, dum, bum, 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 bum. Uh, Susan, Susan Abramovitz ask, uh, extreme right versus extreme left. How can Knesset make a party illegal on the right, Kach, but not on the left, the joint list? One thing was certain, Kach, Kach loves uh, Am Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, Tor Israel, which joint list would like to see a Palestine replace Israel. Okay, look, there's a lot of big issues I can get into here. Um, let me just give you the facts and you can do your own research, make your own, decide for yourselves about this. I don't particularly want to get into my own personal opinion about it. Um, Kach was banned, Kach the forerunner to, um, to Osma Yudit, was banned in the 1980s because of a law which said that a party which is, uh, which um, denies, which formally, as part of its platform, denies Israel as a Jewish state or a democratic state or is a racist party, cannot sit, cannot run for Knesset, Kach was deemed to be a racist party and was banned because of numerous statements that Kahana, Mayor Kahana, the leader of Kaf, had made about Israeli Arabs, and actually ex having an, a, a platform which expressly called for things like um, segregated areas for Jews and Arabs and um, things of that sort. Um, the joint list, the Arab joint list, as I said, it's an amalgam of different Arab parties. Now, it is certainly true that at least one of those parties, Balad, um, has made statements in the past which are clearly against a Jewish state, like the idea of a Jewish state. Um, now, you could make the case that they've been clever enough to not put anything formally in their platform, which could be construed as that, that it's, and, and that these are very, that the, when, when the, when the, Supreme Court has to make these decisions, it's quite loath to ban parties, right? It's, it's, it, Kach is the only party that's been banned and individuals have also very rarely been banned. By the way, it's also the case that other parties which have similar positions to Kach have also not been banned. Osma Yudit, for example. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, you can look at it in different ways. Um, but I, I, I get the point. Like, definitely there is, a, there is a criticism that has been made that, that, that um, the Arabs have been given a pass, whereas um, extreme right-wing Jewish parties, specifically one, was not. Um, but you could also, again, I, you, I, I would advise you, if you want to make a really fact-based judgment on this, you're going to have to look really carefully at what's in the platform of those parties, I think. Um, Benny Gantz said he wouldn't sit with Netanyahu and then did so. So how real are those that say they won't? That's a very fair point. Benny Gantz went back on his word. So did Amir Peretz, by the way, the leader of the Labour Party, who shaved off his famous moustache and said, I will, my moustache, I'm, I'm getting rid of my moustache and, and if my moustache my is not going to, something like, you know, <laughs> to prove that I'm not going to sit with Netanyahu. I'm not sure why I proved that, but that was his point. And then he did end up sitting with Netanyahu. So... For sure, you could say that, that, that parties could go back on their word. That's true. Um, Lieberman and Lapid have a very good record of not going back on their word on this. They've consistently not sat with Netanyahu over these previous elections, having said they won't. Gidon Saar, he could go back on his word. He would lose a phenomenal amount of credibility if he did, because that was the, that was the whole basis 
for establishing his party, right? That he that, that he couldn't stomach what Netanyahu had done with the Likud. If you read, listen to or read his speech when he left the Likud and that of other Likudniks that left the Likud to join him, like Zev Elkin, the, the, the harshness of the criticism of Netanyahu is more extreme than things you've heard from the left. The idea that they would then go and sit with him, I mean, again, nothing's impossible, but it would, I mean, honestly, it would be, I think it would just make them look like a joke. Um, how does a political party get established? Um, in theory, you could, an individual can set up a political party and it has to be registered. It has to meet certain criteria. Um, you can, anyone, I mean, as I said, there are dozens of political parties that run in the, in the Knesset. Most of them get like a few hundred votes. There's a famous party called the Pirate Party, right? Which is this kind of joke party that runs every election. And I don't know what its platform is. <laughs> Established building pirate ships. I don't know. But it's a political party, right? But, but to actually, you know, you have to build up a, in order. The main, the main, establishing a political party is not the, the difficult thing. The difficult thing is building a campaign in which you can actually, and in which you can win votes. What we don't have uh, for Americans, it's a useful uh, distinction from America. We don't have, uh, we have very, very small, um, uh, a very, sorry, a very uh, low ceiling on campaign uh, finance. You can't spend a lot of money financing a political party. There's not like the vast sums of money that are spent on political campaigns in the United States. Um, oh, this is a good question. What would it look like? By the way, I'm, I'm aware that we're running way over time. So if people want to leave, then you can leave. I mean, that's, I, this is being recorded. Um, I'm going to write my, actually, I'm going to let me write my um, email in the chat box. If you email me, you can be on my mailing list and you, or you can simply just ask for the record, for the link to the recording if there's things that you miss. So I'm saying that to you now. Um, so people can leave if they want, but I'm gonna continue this as long as I'm getting questions. Um, okay, what would it look like for the joint list to be part of the government? This is an interesting one. So there has never been an Arab party member of a the government. There have, been Arab, um, there have been a couple of Arab ministers. They've been, minister, they've been ministers within um, mainstream Zionist parties. So there was a minister within the Labour Party who was an Arab, for example, in the last, in recent years. Um, but there have not been specific Arab parties in the government um, for two reasons. They have boycotted joining the government. They have said we will not join a Zionist government. And also they have not been welcome in the government because of positions they've held um, uh, on the Palestinian issue or in some cases being, uh, in the case of, as I did, that party that I mentioned uh, Balad of supporting uh, Palestinian terrorism. Um, there is a question now. It's become a question because um, in the last election, there was a possibility before Benny Gantz split blue and white and joined with Netanyahu. There was a possibility of Benny Gantz forming a coalition again, uh, 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 without Likud. Um, an anti Netanyahu essentially coalition, um, which would be which would not be able to reach sixty one without the joint list. The joint list, according to this proposal, the joint list would not formally join the government, but they would essentially support the government from the outside. So it would be a minority government, but they would be able to pass legislation because the joint list would vote in favour of um, legislation from the outside. This is very, this, this hasn't happened before in Israel. It's by the way, not unusual in other parliamentary democracies. There are other parliamentary democracies in Europe which often have minority governments that work that way. I don't think it's a particularly stable way of, of running things, but it, it's, it's feasible. Um, the joint list to actually be part of the government, you'd need a couple of things to change. I think you would need the joint list, the parties within the joint list to very formally renounce certain past statements that they've made supporting uh, supporting terrorism and being sympathetic to um, to sympathetic to Palestinian uh, violence against Israel against Israelis um, uh, and you would also need to have of course um, uh, parties Zionist parties that would that would be willing to to accept them 
uh, which would probably more likely be on the on the on the cent in the on the centre left than right wing parties. Also, because joint lists presumably wouldn't accept being part of a coalition that was that was you know gung ho on building settlements, for example. Um, so yeah, that's I hope that answers the question. Um, in the event Netanyahu wins, do you think his opponents will accept the legitimacy, or is there a real risk of a theatrical protest, and dangerous riots? similar to anti-Trump leftist organized after he became president. What would have happened then? Okay. Um, look, there are riots, there are protests against Netanyahu. There have been, there have been weekly protests against Netanyahu for the past six months, seven months, I've lost track. Um, weekly protests uh, in Jerusalem outside the Prime Minister's residence and in Tel Aviv uh, every Saturday night um, protests against Netanyahu, starting off as mainly left-wing protests, actually bringing some or some from the sort of anti-Netanyahu right uh, in recent months. Um, so there have been protests. They, ha they haven't been violent. They haven't been, it hasn't been like the riots that you saw in the wake of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter stuff. And there's no equivalent of Antifa in, in the Israeli protest in the Israeli left-wing protest movement, I'm happy to say, at least not yet. Um, can the Knesset pass laws before forming a government? Um, I want to get this right. So not, not, not substantial laws. It's difficult. They can, there can be legislation which affects the way the Knesset is run. It can't, you couldn't have, for example, um, before a government is formed, you couldn't have, I don't know, a law passed raising taxes. So you could like, or, you know, some major economic change. You can have um, procedural things happening in the Knesset. I believe that's the case. Um, uh, this appears to make for unstable governments. All it takes is for someone like Lehman to walk and the government falls. What, if anything, could be done? What would it take? Well, the simple answer is electoral reform, right, to change the system. And numerous things have been proposed over the years. The simplest thing is raising the threshold so you have smaller, so you have fewer smaller parties. That's the most simple thing, but it's, it comes with its own problems. Um, there are other things proposed. One interesting one was to, was to say that the was to say that there's a basically make a law that whichever party is the biggest, the leader of that party automatically becomes prime minister, regardless of um, regardless of coalition building. Um, and the idea of that is that it would encourage people to vote for the big parties, right? So if you're on the right, then you would want then it would be in your interests for the Likud to be as big as possible. So even if you would think, even if you'd be more inclined to vote for Yamina or Shas, you would want to vote for Likud so it's big, as big as possible and therefore it would encourage bigger parties. But there's other more radical proposals. By the way, part of Gidon Saar's platform is um, having some major electoral reform, including um, more uh, representative uh, democracy with, um, I think that's right, with um, uh, constituencies and that kind of thing. Uh, both Giron Saar and Yeshatid, Yair Lapid, um, are running on platforms which include term limits for the Prime Minister. Um, they would claim that that is one of the problems. That's one of the reasons why we have the current situation with Netanyahu, that there aren't term limits. Um, okay. Could a majority pass a law that an indicted politician can't run? Yes, that actually could happen. And that almost did happen. That was what Lapid and Lieberman wanted to do um, and their plan to do. But it was, um, it was before the, after the last election, but it was, it was basically, uh, the plan was ruined by Gantz um, deciding to um, join, start a, a former coalition with Netanyahu instead. Um, bum, bum, bum. Susan Bramovitz, the Supreme Court upset with the Knesset being, a, being indecisive on reform and conservative rabbis conversions being accepted in terms of citizenship. There is no constitution. Based on what formula does the court give itself the right to decide this issue and many others that seem unrelated to Knesset law? Wow. 
Um, so if anyone's not familiar with this, yesterday um, the Supreme Court ruled that reform and conservative conversions uh, that take place in Israel are recognized as legitimate for citizenship when previously they weren't. Um, this happened after basically um, a case was brought uh, 15 years ago um, and the Supreme Court asked the Knesset to rule on this issue and the Knesset has not ruled on this issue. And so the Supreme Court said, the Knesset, we gave the Knesset 15 years, it hasn't ruled on this issue. Meanwhile, these people are stuck in a kind of limbo um, where they don't know if they can be citizens or not. And we're deciding, we're ruling that they can. Um, and it was almost, it was an eight out of nine uh, just Supreme Court justices ruled in favor of this decision. Um, the question from Susan is, based on what form is the court give itself the right to decide this issue? So it's a, there's a long answer to this, um, which I'm not gonna give because it's complicated. And I, I recommend that you go on the Baker Center YouTube channel and look for a, 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 a recording of, a, of one of my, um, it wasn't me talking, I was hosting um, a speaker from the Israel Democracy Institute talking exactly about this issue of the Supreme Court. Um, look it up. I think if you look up um, uh, in the Begin Center YouTube channel, Google, um, or rather Google search for um, uh, Constitutional Revolution or uh, Israel Democracy Institute, and you'll find it. And there's a lot of information there. But the short answer is that there was a basic law. Israel doesn't have a constitution, as you said. We have a series of basic laws which are kind of de facto, have de facto constitutional status. Um, we have a basic law was passed, two basic laws were passed in the early 90s. Um, which, um, were which were basically seen as a kind of bill of rights for Israel. Basically, they were about um, certain uh, fundamental um, rights of individuals, civil rights, I guess you could say, um, which weren't previously on the books uh, in, the Israeli, uh, in the Israeli basic laws. And the Supreme Court, um, based on the wording of those laws, um, decided that it was authorized to rule in matters where the Knesset was not, um, when a case is brought, I mean, it can't just sort of do it for the sake of it, but when a case is brought that they can um, determine that the Knesset is not um, fulfilling its duty of um, protecting uh, fundamental basic rights of individuals in the state. Um, and that was the case in this instance, I believe. Um, and it's a very, it's, it's, de it's, a, it's a big, it's a major controversial issue, right? This is, this is at the heart of the criticism of the Supreme Court from parties like Yamina and also Likud, um, who want to legislate to weaken the Supreme Court. And on the other side, Yeshatid, who have a very, who part of their agenda is protecting the Supreme Court from um, interference by could and Yamina by this kind of legislation. Where do the Druze fit into all this? Not really majorly. They're, I mean, they're, I mean, they're significant in Israel in the set they're very interesting, distinct population who serve in the army and a very interesting um, part of the Israeli mosaic. But they're demographically there, there are very small, they're very small numbers. Um, there's, I mean, we're talking, it's, I mean, it's uh, like. Druze is, I wouldn't like to say, probably I'd say less than 100,000 people, maybe a little more, but not much more than that. Um, so they don't have any electoral significance, really. Um, Christians, someone asked about Christians again. Um, Christians are part of the wider Arab population, right? So Israel is 20% Arab, um, uh, citizens-wise, and of that 20%, around 10% of that our population of Christian. So again, not demographically significant. They don't have a lot of sway politically. Um, how do the Jews vote? I mean, it varies. Uh, some vote for Arab parties, some vote for um, uh, mainstream Israeli parties, including for right-wing parties. Um, okay, I think that's it. That's no more questions, I believe. Um, some of the comments here are just people thanking me, which I appreciate very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so look, I, um, I gave my email address, I wrote it down, you can scroll up to the chat to find it, it is paulg at bagancenter.org.il, 
Email me if you want to join the mailing list for all the events that we have in English. Or if you just want to get the link to the recording, you can ask me for that and I will do so. Um, but thank you very much for joining and I hope it's been informative and helpful. And uh, for those of you in Israel, um, happy voting and I hope you get the result you want. And whatever happens, I hope uh, Israel is stronger and more stable um, afterwards. Okay, Erev Tov, bye-bye.